Okay, here we are. Uh, welcome all to um, Bismarang. This is uh, lesson three of three on Apollo, how to shoot for the moon. I hope you like all like our new, uh, our new logo. Please give us a thumbs up if you do or not. Yay, good, so there we go. Okay, moving, let's move it straight into it then. Um, so quick reminder of what we did last time. Uh, last time we looked at building a marketing framework. And uh, the, uh, the one thing we wanted to say on this is that um, marketing frameworks are pretty central to everything that you uh, do in, in marketing. And if, it, if it's not, it should be. Um, and then you should be doing producing one marketing per, uh, persona, uh, sorry, one marketing framework per persona. So if you do two or three personas, then you do at least two or three marketing frameworks, one for each. You might even have a number of marketing frameworks um, uh, for uh, a single persona, but we've covered that before. So what I'm going to show you first this evening, so this evening is going to be break, break, essentially, essentially broken down into two different areas. Um, the first thing that we're going to show you, we're going to talk about is the funnels principle, also known as pipelines, uh, and how to quantify and grow them. Now, the sales funnels are the building blocks that are required to increase, so significantly increase your sales and marketing performance consistently for the long term. So let me just, just say that again. It's to significantly increase your sales and marketing performance consistently for the long term. So it, it, what we're not going to look at here is something that will, bang, turn your, your, your recruitment for your circles on straight away. This is a longer term process. The second thing that they do is they can create an accurate marketing cost and sales generated forecasts. Uh, which those then, once you have those, will help you sleep at night. Because quite often people have uh, what, was, what I, I refer to as um, forlorn hope marketing or hope marketing, in that um, they think that they are, uh, if they do one single thing, that uh, when they've done that one thing, it'll work and it'll change how their business works or how, they're, they're, how they, they market themselves. And suddenly, all the sales will be coming in. It doesn't work like that. Once you understand your marketing funnels though, you can then start significantly planning forward of I'm going to spend this amount of money or I'm going to take, uh, take these actions and then these, these sales will be generated. And what, then that is what helps you sleep at night. Okay, so let's quickly look at the funnels principle. So um, let's just imagine that your potential customers are working their way through a funnel with multiple fil uh, filters on their journey. So we looked at Be Debs prior last week. She's the marketing persona that we, that we created um, uh, in lesson two of three. Um, and so we're just gonna look at, uh, we'll consider Debs at the moment. So Debs comes into our far, far marketing funnel, sorry, in that, mark in that stimulus and awareness phase, that very top when she hears about us or we make her aware of us um, and she's stimulated to take some action and moving into the research phase, also known as the zero moment of truth. Um, from there, um, she uh, then moves to that first moment of truth and whatever you've set that first moment of truth as is whether they, it's that, that first point where she makes some form of commitment, either downloads from you or picks up the phone or has, um, is doing that research on you, sorry, has, has done that research on you or whatever you, you have de uh, defined as that first moment of truth. That second moment of truth, um, you'll see that uh, for those that have made it to, to their first moment of truth, not all of them make it through into the second moment of truth, depending where you set that. That, that break line. And that ultimate moment of truth is that last bit of the funnel that, um, where everybody says something nice to you. The, the thing to note here is that in each phase, there are less and less and less people. So you've, you're losing your people throughout your funnel all the way through. Um, and then you can, if you've done Debs prior, then if you've got two or three or four or five other personas, each one has its own marketing funnel. Uh, based on the, 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 the marketing framework for each one, and they're all making their way quickly or slowly through your um, customer journey and the five phases. Now, you can, once you've got a number of them, you can group them in whatever way you want to, or whatever way your media plan dictates. So you might say, uh, okay, so I'm going to build my campaign strategy for Facebook, and therefore I have a marketing funnel for Debs Pryor in Facebook, Hardeep in Facebook, and Rebecca in Facebook, and the same with snail mail or, or email. Each one will have a different customer journey, particularly in the first two phases. Uh -huh. But uh, when you're talking about building campaigns for each one, you could then um, uh, group them together by media. 
So let's get into a little bit more detail on the funnels themselves and how we quantify them. So we're just going to take a little example of this funnel and this funnel could be anything. Um, these are slightly made up numbers. I think actually, no, they're not made up numbers. I think these numbers originally came from an email campaign. But let's just assume that we can uh, quantify how many people are in our stim stimulus and awareness phase. But that would normally be termed as, if you're doing this in social media, that might be termed as your reach. It, so it might be when you put in your customer persona details into um, Facebook advertising or into Google AdWords or whatever it's called these days, that it will tell you what reach. And so in this case, the reach or those that we can, uh, that we can actually target in our stimulus awareness phase is 70,000. Now, it might be that you're in an email campaign, that would be the total number of, of email addresses that you're reaching. Uh -huh. So it's that total universe or that total reach is that 70,000 number up here in the top of it. Then we know that, in fact, in this one, when we mail 70,000 people, that we will probably get 350, and that's probably 350 of people either clicking through or whatever. In this case, it is half of 1%, 0 0.005. So that is the initial quantity, 70,000. Then we have a conversion rate of half of 1%, which means that 350 make it into the next phase. And of those 350, um, we reckon a third of them, in this particular case, will make it through to that first moment of truth. So we multiply 3 point, uh, 350 by 0 0.333, and that gives us a total quantity in our, uh, in our first moment of truth phase as 117. Now, you might be quantifying this um, by, the, by the zero moment of truth. It might be that you have um, a specific landing page that people are from that, that mailing campaign are hitting, um, and they're landing on that, and therefore you have a Google Analytics count on that particular page, and that is where you might be getting the 350 number. Your first moment of truth, that might be actually the number of people so that phone calls are made, you know, made to you, or how many uh, forms were filled in, or how many downloads of your white paper it may be, might have been, or how many people, whatever they did, and they made that first commitment to you and contacted you. And then that second moment of truth for that, for in this particular case, is those that actually joined, so or bought, or made a sale, or purchased from. So you've got 117 in that that, that moment of truth, and five percent of them of that 117 actually. Uh, parted with hard cash or signed up or whatever it may be, which gives us in that second moment of truth a number that the number of six people. So, your macro conversion rate from uh, from the top of your reach just may have been seventy thousand, but you then only actually have once you get down to the bottom of it, only have six that have actually committed to you and bought and taken part in your uh, in either your circle or bought your product or whatever it may be. And of those six, we in this particular case. We have estimated that a third of them have uh, then in that, gone into that ultimate moment of truth where they've said something positive to you, positive about you um, and told all their friends or whatever it may be. So uh, when people talk about conversion rates, or oh, I've got a fantastic conversion rate of one in three, okay, or 30%, whatever it may be, the actual thing to, 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 to understand when they say that they've got a great conversion rate is at what point which conversion rate are they talking about? Uh, because uh, usually you'll find that the macro conversion rate is actually really, really, really small. Uh -huh. So in this particular case from an email campaign, 70,000 people emailed, six sales made. Okay, so I digress slightly. Now, what we are producing here is what I refer to as the magic nine numbers. We have five quantities, so we have one, two, three, four, five quantities, and then we have four conversion rates, one, two, three, four. And those are the magic nine in any funnel or combination of funnels that you put together that you are then going to use further on down the line for building your KPIs or key performance indicators. Now, if I want to increase my sales by 50%, and if we assume that the, this, this funnel here on the left-hand side is profitable, uh -huh, and assuming that the conversion rates in each stage remain the same, if you increase the uh, stimulus and awareness phase, or you reach by 50%, you should then, in fact, increase, let me just move this over here, you should then, in fact, increase your sales by 50%. It will apply all the way through. 
i.e. if your funnel is profitable and you simply want to make more money and you can handle the, more, the extra workload, simply increase the amount that goes in the top of the funnel. And as long as the conversion rates are good and, you're, and it's a profitable funnel, that's the quickest way you'll grow your sales. Simple as. Um, however, if you're really going to block box clever, then um, what you need to do is uh, start working on the conversion rates. Um, so let's have a quick look at this. So if you improve your conversion rates, let's just note here in this first moment of truth that we have 117, um, uh, we have 117 people in that first moment of truth. Uh, in that second moment of truth, we have six and we have two in that ultimate moment of truth. Now, if we increase the conversion rate in each phase by 15%, then with the wonders of compound interest, in fact, it increases a 15% improvement at each of those conversion rates all the way through, will give you a 50% improvement in sales and ultimate moment of truth. And note that the quantity at the top is exactly the same. Now, bearing in mind that this stimulus and awareness phase, I've said it before, uh -huh, that the stimulus awareness phase and the zero moment of truth phase are usually by far the most expensive pay, uh, uh, phases of a, of a sales and marketing fan, um, campaign or recruitment, circle recruitment campaign, that in fact, anything that you can do to improve your performance of your marketing um, is going to um, give you a significantly better return on investment. Okay, so literally, if you improve your sales by 50% on this, depending how much you, you've you spent on your uh, on your initial investment in your advertising, you probably find that you're getting a, something like 150 or 200 percent return on increase in return on your investment. Uh -huh. So the big trick here is box clever, and the only way you can do to do that is to understand your magic nine. Once you understand your magic nine, then then you can start understanding what KPIs to watch and how we can box clever. And the way to do that is to learn to fail. Fail fast, forward, and cheap. Okay? That sounds, you know, because back to our initial thing that we always say that anytime you do a new marketing campaign or a new advertising campaign, 80% of the spend is going to be wasted. Just get used to it and understand it. And then once you understand it, then you, you know that 80% of what you're going to do is going to fail, but what you need to do is to make sure that when you fail, you do it quickly, you do it, uh, you do it cheaply, and that you learn from it, i.e. you fail fast, forward and cheap. And the way to do that is to test, 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 and test again. Wash and repeat, test, 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 and test again. And we'll be coming on to that in a little bit more detail in a minute. So, i.e., what you want to do is to understand how to fatten the funnel first and then spend wise money filling it. So fattening, fattening the, the funnel first, understanding how you can make these uh, the conversion rates bigger, so that you get a better bang for your buck. So if you imagine that if we could extend, if, if this was if the size of this funnel or the edge of this funnel represented how many um, people were actually in the funnel at that point, what you want to do is make that funnel fatter. I, you're not losing so many people uh, at each phase all the way through. So fatten the funnel first, then spend wise money filling it. So, and then as I say, wash and repeat consistently. So. Fatten the funnel in Facebook, then fatten the funnel in LinkedIn, then fatten the funnel in email and sna snail mail, whatever. If you have a full marketing department, you can do all of them at the same time. But actually, I would suggest that you do one at a time. Okay. So your task, your first task, actually, <laughs> this, over this, this, this week, Christmas or otherwise, or in fact, actually, um, uh, over the next couple of weeks, is to... Create your first funnel. The way to do that is choose a, me, uh, a persona and a media type. List the actions in the customer journey in Excel. Identify the conversion points and add some guesstimate numbers to start with. Okay, and there will be examples of funnels in, uh, in the assets uh, section or part of this um, lesson. And then please, 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 please share your work by creating a, uh, a post in the course or in the circle newsfeed. Okay. So that was the first part of what we're going to do today. Um, oh, there we go, we've done that bit. Right, 
Okay, what I'm going to show you now is how to make adjustments in a funnel to make multiple micro gains to improve that macro performance, i.e. how you fatten that funnel. At the end of this, I, I aim that you have a, a basic understanding or a basic understanding of how split testing works and how it drives the whole process. And essentially, there are three steps to follow. First one, pick a funnel. Uh -huh. We've already talked about this, pick a funnel. In this case, we're going to, we're going to use Debs prior, uh -huh. uh, the target audience and a media channel. So we're going to, sorry, we're going to use uh, Debs prior and Facebook. Okay, list the micro steps in the entire customer journey. So if you go back to your um, marketing framework and that entire actions list in the marketing framework, copy and paste it all into a, um, an Excel sheet down the left-hand side. In this case, this is, we're saying that she's browsing Facebook, she notices her ad, she reads the text, she clicks the link, she hits the landing page, she reads the text there, she then clicks the buy now or join now or whatever it may be, fills in the form and then completes the sale. So, and then the third, third step is once you've identified those micro steps in the entire customer journey, add your conversion points uh, with indicative data points. Okay, what do we mean by that? By that? So data point one in this, in this case is the, the stimulus and awareness phase is the stats that we get from Facebook, the reach that we get from Facebook. So we have taken um, uh, Debs' persona, we've gone to the Facebook ad buying tool, we've put in the, um, the description, essentially the description of, of Debs and the geographical area and, and the Facebook has come back and said, we've got a reach of 70,000 of, of, of people like this. Uh -huh. Then we've selected our second data point. In this case, it's going to be um, when she clicks the link. Okay, and we're going to get those either from Facebook, Facebook stats, or Google Analytics when she lands on the website. So I, she sees the ad, she clicks on the link, and Facebook will record that as a click, um, but Google Analytics will also uh, uh, record it when she then clicks through onto the page that she's just landed in. Okay? And in there, she reads the text. The third data point we're going to pick on this one is when she clicks the Buy Now button. Again, Google Analytics will pick that up um, and also the analytics on uh, any other web page analytics you've got. Um, and then she fills in the form, uh, which could be another data point if you wanted it because you get the form, the form uh, filled in. And then in this case, she completes the sale and then uh, we get those data points from our Stripe account or whatever tool you might be using. So the point being is that we're understanding at each one of our conversion points or in our magic nine, uh, where we're going to get those quantities um, uh, and for those specific stats on those magic nine. We're only showing four here, but you get the idea. So bear, remember, we've always said that in your marketing framework, it's a customer journey and it is a linear relationship. People go from one step to the next, some from one phase, so from the stimulus awareness phase into the zero moment of truth phase when they do the, the, the research, and then into that first moment of truth, and then into that second moment of truth, and then in that into the ultimate moment of truth. So certainly the first four are a linear relationship. You don't jump straight from being made aware of a product or a circle or whatever, straight into um, uh, that first moment of truth where you make a commitment. You, a person will do some form of research. But don't forget what we have said about the ultimate moment of truth in social media or a word of mouth recommendation is that that recommendation takes the person through those, both of those steps straight, straight through without touching the sides. I, if I make a recommendation to Shane to buy an Audi and he believes every word that I, do, that, that I say, which of course he does, then in fact, actually he then automatically <laughs> goes and uh, buys an Audi uh, without even thinking about it, okay? But so I have, he, he has assumed that I have done the research, so I've done the research for him. He might ask me the odd question, which would be him in his zero moment to truth phase. Okay, so you can see here that if you improve your um, reach on Facebook, that in fact, actually, you will probably increase uh, the, the amount of clicks that you get to your link. Now, uh, the reason I say, well, probably because just because you have more people reaching or you're reaching more people 
doesn't necessarily mean that your conversion rate will be just the same for those people. Okay, so you might have identified 70,000 people who are a really good fit for you, and then you then Facebook suggests another 100,000, but in fact, they're not quite the same. They might live in a different area, or they might be using a different device, type of device, or whatever it may be. Uh huh. But uh, they, they, you can make assumption that they will probably increase the click through, but they may, they might well not. When they hit the landing page, um, and because there's now more of them, if you improve the text that is now on the landing page, or the or the, the pictures, or the look and feel, or the, the user experience on that, that landing page, if you improve that, then it will probably increase the amount of people that clicks through. In fact, so improving is a not pejorative, but it's a subjective thing. So by improving something, you might make it to change it to make it look as if it's, it, it looks and feels better, but it doesn't actually perform because you've improved it for what you think it looks good, um, but Deb's, um, her, that your customer persona might not actually think it does. And as a consequence, those 70,000 people have hit that page, um, you start losing people. Okay, so, and then improving that the form that they fill, they fill in will probably increase the, in the sales. So the point that we're saying here is that all those, these little micro improvements, micro improvements will increase the conversion rate at that next stage. It's not all about one big massive change or one significant change. It's not. It's about lots and lots and lots of little, uh, little micro changes. And this applies to not just marketing, it, it applies to uh, sporting teams. So if you ever uh, are interested in rowing, for example, there was a, a, a book written um, about the 1983 Oxford Blue Boat Team where they hadn't, lot, they hadn't won in about 15 years and this American guy came in and he started managing it, the whole thing. And it was all about those significantly different, uh, the, sorry, significantly small little improvements all the way through. Again, actually just talking about rowing, I was with my son on a rowing, we in the gym yesterday, we were both on rowing machines, we were exactly the same setup, um, uh, rowing for half an hour, and he, because he has a slightly longer reach than me, he reached one more inch on every pull, all the way through, literally one, well, but maybe one and a half inches on every pull, and in fact, in 30 meters, he rowed the equivalent of another 1,000 meters more than I had, about 15% more further than I had. But that, just that extra one, that minor improvement, got it all the way through. The book about the rowing is called How to, um, uh, How, to Make the Boat, uh, How to Make the Boat Go Faster. But the UK cycling team uh, and the Sky, Sport, uh, Sky Cycling Team, run by Dave Brailsford or Sir Dave Brailsford, it's exactly the same. It's why they, they managed to take UK cycling from nothing to major Olympic win uh, winners in eight uh, over two Olympic cycles. And it was done on minor, lots and lots of minor improvements. Okay, so to improve your, 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 your funnel, it's like picking a lock. It's not like somebody has a magic key because they don't exist, uh -huh. but it's, if you imagine a barrel lock that where you put the key in and you can feel it going on to the next stage and to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage, and then once it's all the way in and all the right buttons are being pushed, turn the key and the door opens. And so think of your marketing funnel as something as similar to that that it's lots and lots of little things that need to go right for you to make that, that sale or that to, to recruit somebody into your circle. The last thing I would say is though, beware of macro factors and monitor the performance of the funnel as a whole, i.e. Um, if you are selling skis and trying to sell them from April onwards, unless you live in New Zealand, it ain't going to go too well. All right? Um, because of course it's summertime. You might get other macro factors like Christmas holidays appearing or uh, whatever it may be. It, you might get hit by a global downturn in, um, as we had in 2008. Or one that hit, hit me before as well, not only a global downturn, but 9-11. Okay, all these macro factors that you have absolutely no control over will likely to have some effect, i.e. don't become a complete, complete data nerd. Well, you should be a data nerd, but don't, um, but don't miss the point that in fact, 
your customers live in the real world and they'll be, affect, they'll be affected by what goes on in the real world. So just because one particular factor is looking or one particular result is looking slightly strange, have a look at the macro factors around it before you start binning that particular change, that last change that you did. So, and then the third step is create a, a spreadsheet with your data points. Uh -huh. And you'll see here, in this particular case, 22,649 uh, emails sent. And we have a uh, market conversion rate of 0 0.17, which is 3794 opens, 246 clicks, 23 demo requests, 11 demos booked, nine demos done, no deals done on that particular one. And that was because, in fact, actually, um, this, this particular one had a, a four to five week flash to bang time. So the results here would actually be reflected down here. But the point being is that what we have here in this particular one is anything in red is a, um, an input number that we can change. Anything in black is driven by um, uh, an algorithm or by a function. And in this particular case, it would have been uh, that what percentage is this number of opens of that number of emails sent, i.e. what was my conversion rate, and it automatically calculated the conversion rate as 0.17. I, I know that I've sent 22,649 emails, and I know that I've had 3,794. And I just write that number in there. Oops, take that back. So I write that number in this uh, field, and I write that number in that field, and it automatically calculates the conversion rate. And the same then, when I, as soon as I put this number in here, it is when then automatically calculated the conversion rate there. Very, it looks very complicated. It's actually very simple to build. There will be an example of this in the post after this lesson. Um, there are lots and lots of tools out there that will do these things for you. Things like HubSpot and Salesforce and Zimplify and Marketo and absolutely if you're doing major marketing campaigns, you really, really should be using one of those tools, but not until you have built it um, in yourself in a rough version in Excel. And so therefore you can understand how your funnels are working. So you understand every single little number that is in there. Otherwise, the default settings in HubSpot or Marketo or whatever it may be, might actually be end up be giving to you what you perceive as a, uh, as a, uh, a false positive result, et cetera. So keep it simple, stupid to start, build it in Excel. And then when you're really super duper good, then, you can, then you're gonna start actually adding lots of major vo volume, uh, volume of numbers, then start finding a specific piece of software that, to use it and then set it up for your own funnels. Okay, a little bit on split testing. Okay, rule number one, get an experienced professional. If you're buying any form of media, I also say get an, uh, uh, an experienced professional. However, if you are going to do it, to, um, uh, the second rule is the aim is to persuade the viewer to take action. All right? So by what that points, what that means is that you might have a reach of 70,000 people. Your primary aim is not to get them, at the, when they're in that phase, is not to get them into your circle or not to sell them your product at that point. Your primary aim is to get them into that next phase, which is the zero moment of truth. You know they're going to go there anyway, that's what they want to do, and so that's what you give them. You don't, don't, don't try and say, here, I've got this wonderful circle, you should join it right now, because they just won't, okay? They will want to do their research on you. So the, the aim is to persuade the viewer to take action to get them into that next stage of the funnel. Uh -huh. Rule number three, every element can be tested. So in an ad, a headline, the picture, the body text, the call to action, whatever. Every, and the same on a landing page. The words, the color of the buttons, the pictures that you use, the headlines, the length of copy, the, the style of copy that you use, etc. Every element can be tested. And then rule number four, test only one variable at a time i.e. picture A versus picture B or headline A versus picture B of uh, headline B, etc. And then multiple variations of, a, of each. So picture B, oh, sorry, picture A with headline B and so on and so forth. So just a little example, if I was to say this is a picture, I'm going to show you a picture of a silhouette of a young woman, that doesn't really help because type A is actually, as you can see, they're both pictures of young women. They just happen to be to very different people in very different modes of, it might be the same person, but they're in different modes uh, at, at the moment. So, as we said, split testing. What, this is how we learn to fail. 
fail fast, forward, and cheap, i.e., I might test <clears throat> type A picture type A against picture type B. If type A performs better, then that's the one that I, can, uh, I, I use. I then might then pick a, a, a type C and test that. I run the campaign, um, the, the two of them side by side, and if type C beats type A, we keep type C, and so on and so forth. I then might test type C with type uh, A headline. Uh -huh. and uh, sorry, yes, to test it with t and then try, then try type B headline with type C picture and see how that performs. If that performs better, I keep it. If it doesn't, I dump it. Uh -huh. So it's all about these lots and lots of little mic mi uh, micro tests. So your second weekly channel challenge, you've got two, as I say this week, is to create a dummy ad and three test versions, each testing a different element. Okay, so the elements of the ad will be a headline, okay? And as I say, there's a hint there, look again at your needs and value propositions in previous lessons. That will give you a very good idea of what your headline needs to be. So that's the needs column uh, in your marketing framework and the value proposition that you've got in there. The picture, okay? It should be relevant but attention grabbing. Short description, I look again at the value proposition exercise including the proof points. I'm not entirely sure that if, we, if we, all of you did that in this particular case, but um, we, I know you have all done it before, and I will send you something that's separately about value proposition. But your value proposition, including those proof points, will help you fill out your short description. It will also, if you have done the community design course, look at your description there that you've, you've, you've produced on your community design course. And the call to action. Remember where you want them to go next. Uh, I enter their zero uh, research phase. I click here to find out more. Or if they're in the zero moment of, uh, of truth, um, like what you see, click here to register. Uh -huh. It's that call to action to take them next through to the next stage. And then as we said before, please, 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 please share your work by creating a post in the course or circle newsfeed. Good. And with that, there you go. That is lesson three of three rushed through, but I know how good you people are. Um, and we're going to get lots of examples in the newsfeed now where you can show us all how what a wonderful, wonderful circle uh, that you're going to boost for the moon. Have we any questions from the floor? No? Okay, Shane. No, I'm just thinking. Um, uh my head, no, sorry, no, no, don't do that, it might hurt. <laughs> okay, well, if that's the case, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, stop the recording. Um, oh, hang on. And, uh, and we'll leave it there. So... Uh,